Hello and welcome. Today we are learning about the Fetch API along with promises, denables, callbacks, and async await. Let's get started. Today our main topic is the Fetch API, but that also requires a discussion of callbacks, promises, denables, and async await. So we'll start with callbacks. Callbacks are just functions really that are passed to other functions as parameters. So they will call that function after they finish doing their other stuff. So a quick example of defining a function with a callback, we can have the word function and then let's just call this first function and we might have a parameter or however many parameters we want. And then we could have a callback and that callback is a function. So in the function we would do stuff with the parameters or whatever and at the end we would call that callback function. And that allows us to call a function that in turn will call another function and it essentially is a chain of events. Well promises are designed to get rid of this but let's show you the problem and the reason people wanted to get rid of this. This could be called and is also known as callback hell. I don't know if I would call it hell, but it could be a problem. And what happens and how this code looks when you use callbacks, if you're using several consecutively, say you'd have your first function and you'd pass in your parameter and then you would have your space for the callback parameter. And here you could put in an anonymous function. And now inside that anonymous function, you would call a second function that's designed to also have a callback. So it could have a parameter and then you'd have an anonymous function there. And then maybe you've got a third function that does the same thing and it could have a parameter, an anonymous function there. And you can see what's happening here. And each level you go deeper, and of course there could really be things in between here like we're doing stuff here. After a while, your code can get a little hard to follow, and each consecutive function that has its own callback is another level of indents, and the code just gets a little hard to follow. And you probably see this in some legacy code before promises existed, because this was a common way of doing things, but it is also called callback hell, and promises are a way to get rid of that. So now let's look at a structure without callbacks, because we won't be using those but at least you understand why we've moved on to promises. So with promises, and I'll put the focus here on promises, they can have three states. So we need to understand each state of promises. One is pending, another is fulfilled, and a third is rejected. Now promises will deliver async code. JavaScript is usually synchronous, meaning doing one thing at a time. But a promise is kind of like, hey man, I promise I'll pay you back tomorrow if you loan me the money today. Or you go ahead and I'll catch up once I'm finished with my task over here. So a promise could be pending while some other JavaScript code goes ahead and executes. A promise, it can be working on it, in other words. So you're actually executing two different uh, blocks of code at once in that regard. So let's look at a promise. I'll just define it as my promise. And there is a promise object, so we'll use that for this example. We'll say new promise. And promises can resolve or reject. And then pass this along. We see that's in an anonymous function. And in this resolve or reject, I'm just going to define, say, an error variable. Right now I'll set it to, well, let's set it to false to start out with. Then we'll say if the error is false, we're going to resolve, and in this we'll say, uh, yes, resolved the promise and then else will reject, there we go, and we'll say no 
rejected the promise. Okay, now that we've defined my promise, well, I've got an unexpected token, a typo there. There we go. Okay, now that we have defined my promise, we can use my promise. And I'm going to show you an example here. You'll be tempted to do this, but it won't work. But this will let me display the state of the promise though. And then I'll show you why this won't work. We'll just go console log my promise. Now we would expect to get the resolve value here because promise is false. And if promise, well, if the error is false, this value is false. And if this is false, it's supposed to resolve and it would return, yes, resolve the promise. But let me show you what actually happens. We get promise fulfilled. And then you see, yes, resolve the promise. But this is the state of the promise. This is not actually returning the value like we would work with the value in our program. Um, instead, to get the value out of a promise, we need to chain. Remember how callbacks in that example were chaining because the first function that had a callback would call the second function in its callback position and the second function would call the third function. They were chained together. So promises can also be chained together. And with ES6, when promises first came about around 2015, I believe, uh, we did that through chaining venables. And that's the next word up here is the focus is a venable. So let me show you an example of that before we get to async await, which async await, of course, will replace the venables that we used at first with promises. But let's look at the venables first. So here's my promise. Now, instead of logging and just trying to get that information, and of course that didn't work as you see here in the console, we saw the state, but we didn't really get the information. We need to go dot then, and then let's look at the value that the promise delivers. And this is an anonymous function, and we can log the value. Now I'm going to save this and we can compare. Now you see in the console Instead of getting the state of the promise, which is fulfilled, we actually got what the resolve returns from the promise, and that is yes, resolve the promise. And then with a thenable, you can add another then and do something else. Let's call this new value. And let's look here. This, this of course, is another anonymous function. So here we can just return value plus one, whatever. We just modify the data. And then that will be the new value passed here because new value is the parameter for this anonymous function. And then we'll console log new value. And you can see now it has the number one after the exclamation mark here because we returned value plus one and it went down to the next then. And sometimes you'll see it with the then on not on the same line as the promise, or you could have it all in one line actually, because these are just chained together as we do with methods as well. So we've got the promise and it resolves, and then we return the value from the promise plus one, then we log the new value. Now, if there's an error, let's look at that. So let's change this error to true, and let's look at what happens in the console. Now the promise state is rejected. And this says uncaught in promise. We didn't really catch this error. And then we see no rejected the promise. But we can catch an error in chain thenables. What we do at the very end is chain a catch. And this catch can also have an anonymous function and it passes in the error object. And we just say console dot, let's go with error and pass in that error. And now when I save this, you can see on line 27, which is where we log the error, we caught that error. And if an error happens anywhere along the way in here, including in the promise itself, it goes through the chain and at the very end, it just logs that error. So it could skip the rest of the chain actually. Whenever it encounters that first error, it goes straight to the catch.
and you've got no rejected the promise. So that is how a promise works. You've got, I'll give you an example, of course, of pending here very soon. We've looked at the state of fulfilled. We've looked at the state of rejected. And this is a promise. Now the fetch API returns a promise on its own. We don't have to create a new promise. And I'll show you that here in just a minute. But this gives you an idea of promises and the fetch API does return a promise. Okay, before giving you an example of a pending promise, let's look at a reason we have these promises, just like replacing the callbacks we mentioned. Uh, another reason, and a big reason, of course, for using the Fetch API is requesting data from another server or another site out there on the web. And what can happen is we can have to wait we need to wait for that data to come back before we can work with it. So we need to tell our code, hey, wait for this and then do this after we get it. And that kind of makes sense when you look at the chain of Venables. But before we work with Fetch, let me give you another example. And one way to kind of, oh, I guess simulate uh, how fetch works is to use a timeout in JavaScript, and that is to delay the execution of some code. So I'm going to create a second promise here, and I'll call it my next promise. And this is going to equal a new promise, and it will also have resolve and reject, as our first one did in that anonymous function. Okay, but inside this one, I'm going to use the set timeout function in JavaScript. And this is part of the window object, so you could have window.setTimeout, but of course you can omit the window. Now this is an anonymous function, and to spell that out, I'll use the keyword function, and whoops, put the operator there, and then I'm missing that. There we go. So that is a callback right there for the set timeout. And then it accepts this function. And then we can put in exactly how long we want to wait. And I'm going to tell it three seconds. So it'll be very obvious that, hey, there's a delay before this code executes. Now inside here, we'll just put resolve. And then we can put my next promise resolved. And so after three seconds, we should get that return from this promise. And now we can call both of these promises in much the same way. So let's say we're going to call my next promise first in our code. And then we'll take the value from that and we'll log the value. And then we can do the same thing. I'll just copy this with the first promise. And so we've defined a couple of promises and then we call my next promise first. And then after that we call my promise. Let's go ahead and see what we get in the console. Oh, of course I left that as an error. Let me go ahead and change that back to no error so that doesn't happen. So we resolved the first promise and then three seconds later my next promise resolved. Even though we called my next promise first, we called this into action right here, of course, we saw the result from my promise first because of the three second delay, which here's the three second delay, which is a, a pretty big delay as far as JavaScript goes. But I just wanted to make it clear that that delay happens and maybe we need to wait on some code coming back from another server before we can move on. And this is an example also that shows you that JavaScript really doesn't wait. It's not built into waiting. But this is an example of my next promise going, you go ahead, you go ahead and run the rest of the code and I'll catch up. And that's exactly what happens because we see the result from my promise before we see it from my next promise.
Okay, now that we've explored promises completely and we're ready to look at an example of the third state that I haven't shown, and that is the pending state of promises. And we need to do that with the Fetch API. It's an easy way to display that. So what I'm going to do is define a variable called users, and it is going to uh, be equal to the promise that is returned from Fetch. Now Fetch, will request data from another place on the web, for example. So in this example, I'm going to use JSON placeholder dot typeycode dot com, and we're going to uh, request users. This is a great site to get some example API data from, and that's what Fetch will work with. And in this result, we should get a pending state of the promise because I'm going to attempt to log the result of the promise right away. Of course, you don't want to do this when you're trying to actually work with the data from a promise. This would be a mistake, but it will display the state of the promise. So let's take a look and we get a promise pending. That's because this promise has not resolved. It is still kind of working on it. It's that where I said, go ahead, you guys, I'll catch up. I've got some work to do. And so the rest of the code goes ahead, but uh, the promise is still working on it. So we attempted to log the user's value, essentially, what would be returned from the promise while it was still working on it. And that's why we need to wait and we wait uh, traditionally with thenables, we say, okay, promise, finish up, and then do this. So let's look at another example of that. And I'll take this same fetch. And after the fetch, instead of just ending right there with the semicolon, I'll put then, and we get our response from the API. And once we get that response, it's not really uh, ready to work with yet. And we could log that, I guess. But I also want to show you why it's not ready to work with. I guess I'll save this first. We'll log that response. And here you see the response. But once again, it's not ready to work with. We really want JSON. You can even see that in the name of this API, JSON placeholder. But uh, we want JSON to work with. And this is a readable stream. So we'll look at the body we get. And we see this right here. And it says readable stream. It's not data we can work with quite yet. So what we need to do is call the JSON method of that readable stream that, that's available here. The body, that's actually a body mixin is how it's referred to in MDN. So what we'll do is take the response and then call the JSON method for that. And we'll return this response here. So instead of logging that, we're going to return that. And now we'll have JSON. So then we need to go to the next then. Now we have our JSON data. We'll just call it data. And here, let's log the data we get from the API. And you can see we get uh, 10 objects back from the API, these 10 user objects. And we can expand that. And you can see each one of these has information about the user from the API. So once we've got the data, we can work with it. But we need to remember that it's within this block of this anonymous function. We can't just suddenly take the data out into the global area here because that's not uh, executing the code in the same order. This is saying grab the data from the API with fetch, then turn it into JSON, and then work with it here. But outside of this, in the global space, it will go ahead and execute code below the fetch in our file before this is complete. And we could look at an example of that as well. But first, we'll go ahead and say data for each, and now I'll put, whoops, user, 
and let's just log each user. And this is an example of working with the data in this chain. And now we've got in our console a log of each user. We pulled that data right out of the JSON and pulled each user instead of returning 10 at once. So like I was talking about the example of not trying to refer to this data, if we had this, let's call this users again. We can get rid of this, what we have up here. And I'll just say users equals fetch. We're going to kind of run into the same problem we had before because if I think I'm going to get that data from users and just log the data here, or whatever is in users, we're going to run into the same problem. You see, users logged first, and it's that pending promise on line 18. Then we get everything on line 14, because this has to actually go get the data and come back and it's waiting, but it's a promise and it says, hey JavaScript, go ahead and execute the rest of the code while I'm doing this. And that is why line 18 is executing and we see the promise pending before we get these results. This line does not wait on this code. And that is the main thing you kind of want to understand at first about how promises work. And fetch returns a promise. So we're working with promises. Also, this method here, the JSON method of the body mixing, returns a promise. So each one of these is returning a promise as we go through the thenables chain. So we have to consider that and say, okay, this is going to happen and then after it happens, this will happen. And then after this happens, this will happen. But this or anything else that we just put that's outside of this denable chain for the promise is not going to happen in that order. It's going to go ahead and execute and not wait on this. Now, what can happen also with data that we get in this manner, we could continue to work with it and although it's not callback hell, as we previously described, we have then, and then dot then, and dot then, and this can kind of get out of hand too. And you can have a huge chain of thenables, and that is also not desirable. And about, I believe, ES 2017, uh, maybe 2018, but I think it's 2017, is when async and await came about. They're keywords, kind of syntactic sugar that hides what's going on. It's another way of telling your code, wait for this to happen before I do this. But it lets us write the code in a much cleaner manner in how we're used to writing code without chaining these thenables. So let's take a look at that. Okay, moving on from thenables to async await. So I'll put that up here as the focus. Async, if I could spell await, there we go. I won't get rid of all of this code, but I'm going to show a couple of examples for sure. And so I'm going to start out with an object defined in the global space. And we'll have my users be the object. And then we'll have a user list and that user list is going to equal a blank array at first, at least. And so there is our my users object in the global space. And then I want to define a function. Now, when we define a function that is going to use async await, we need to tell the function right at the beginning. So we can say async function and then just name the function. I'll call it my cool function. And then we would have our function as we normally define it. Now, I like to use arrow functions. And so that looks just a little different than this syntax. But you could see it this way. I would have const my cool function and then equals async and then the arrow. And so the only difference you've noticed from when uh, we've defined arrow functions in the past is adding the async keyword there. Or traditionally with the my 
uh, with the function keyword, you put async before the function keyword. So those are the two different ways of doing that. Now inside this function, I'm going to define a response variable. And that's going to be equal to what we get from fetch. Now I'm going to request the same data from JSON on placeholder, but I'm going to use the await keyword. And this is telling my code, wait, wait to get these results from the uh, fetch that requests that from the JSON placeholder API before doing what comes next. So at this point, we're going to wait for this to finish before we do the next thing. And the next thing I can define as JSON, whoops, JSON user data. And I can set that equal to await once again because this JSON method also returns a promise. So in both of these examples, I'm awaiting a promise to resolve before I get that data. And then I can just return the JSON user data. Or if I wanted to do something with that user data at this point, like log it, I could. So I could say console.log JSON user data. And we will actually have that data at that point to log because we are awaiting each of these promises to be fulfilled before we do the next thing within this function. And it's an async function. And then we, of course, need to call the function. So we would say my cool function and we can call that. Now I haven't done anything with the my users object yet but I will here in just a minute. Let's go ahead and save this and you can see we once again get the 10 users returned as JSON. Now if we wanted to loop through those here we could uh, like I did with the for each before but that just got rid of our thenables because we're just using these keywords async and await. Now, to use the keyword await, it must be within an async function. And if we're going to call this function and do anything else with this data, it of course needs to happen in order again. And that is where we get into the next part where we could have a second function. And that second function would also need to be async. So let's say const, and let's just call this another function. Now let's go func just so I don't use that word in there too much. Okay, and then equals async once again. So our another func is an async function and this function can await for my cool function to complete because it's returning essentially data that is coming from promises. That's an async function. And then we could log whatever we get there. So instead of logging that JSON user data within that function, we can go ahead and log it within this function. And we'll need to set this to data at least. So we can call it something and we'll log that here in another func. So instead of calling this function right here, let's call another func here and see what we get. And once again, we get the same result. So these are chained together in that regard. And in this function, we call my cool function and we await the results from this async function before we attempt to log the data that we get from it or work with it in any other way. Now, the reason I have this my users object up here is because this is where mistakes can happen. Mistakes can be made. And we'll take this same data and let's say we're going to go ahead with this second function in this data. And instead of logging it, we're going to say my users dot user list 
equals data because that's already an array that we've seen. And that should work. We would get that. But let's say, okay, we've called all of this and we want to go ahead and do something with the user list in my users. And let's just try to log it right here. My users dot user list. Let's see what we get. We're not logging anything in these functions, so this should be the only log statement. We still get an empty array, just like we defined it here. Now let's think about why this happened. We waited for these functions to execute. Another func is waiting for my cool func to get that data, and we call another func before we attempt to log to the console. But here's the problem. We need to remember that these promises are like, hey, I'm going to do my work, but you go ahead. And there's nothing about this console log statement that is waiting for anything else. Uh, it is not within these functions. It is not going to await anything. So when this script executes, sure, these are defined. And sure, we call this function that calls the others, but this function essentially has things inside of it that are saying, hey, JavaScript, go ahead and do what you need to do, and we'll get back to you. And that is a reason that this is still empty. We need to do it within this chain. So if we wanted to go ahead and put this same log statement inside our function after we set it, uh, set the data here, then we should probably get the result we expect because it's inside the function. We've waited for these other things to complete. Then we have set the user list equal to the data, and then we're logging the user list. And I'll go ahead and I'll leave this console log statement here as well. And let's see what we get. And as expected, we do get that array of 10 users for our user list, but it only is delivered to the console after the empty array is uh, delivered because we log this and this is actually happening first, even though we called this function here. So we have to kind of be aware of this chain of events that is happening. And if we want to work with the data we're getting from an async function that is awaiting data from an API at another website. And then of course we're calling that function within another async function. We need to have our expectations lined up to where we're going to work with the data inside that function, or we're going to pass that data to another function, say at this point where this console log is on line 21, we could pass the data to another function and that function could then work with that data because it's only called after these things have completed. But if we just have it out here as kind of a procedural top-down code and we're not waiting on things to happen within a function, just because we call this function another func doesn't mean this line of code is going to wait for those promises to resolve. So does it seem straightforward so far or possibly clear as mud? So let's look at some examples to hopefully clear this up. And even if it does seem straightforward for you, um, some examples couldn't hurt, right? So let's take a look at examples. And we'll start out with what I would call a workflow function. And this function is going to be called, I'll just get rid of this object here. We'll call this get all user emails and we'll make it an async function and we're going to work with fetch inside the function so much like we had in my cool function which I could maybe just get rid of this part and get rid of that I guess we'll have the response equal to the users being fetched from JSON placeholder and then We'll get the JSON user data from the uh, response.json, which is also returning that promise with await. And then we'll do something else. Once we've got that user data, 
instead of returning it right away or anything else, we'll go ahead and define a user, uh, let's call it email array. That'll work. We'll set that equal to the JSON user data. And then we'll use the higher order function map. And we'll just go through for every user because that's the full user object that has all of their information. We just want to return within this higher order function, the user.email. So this will give us a user email array when we're finished with that. And then we can return that or log it to the console or whatever. So let's just log it to the console and we'll have user email array is logged to the console. I'll eliminate all of that, and of course, then we need to call this function. So let's call get all user emails. And let's see what we get. We get an array full of 10 emails. Once again, this seems straightforward. We have an async function. We await the response from JSON placeholder. And once we get that, that's a promise fulfilled. We have the readable stream, and so we take that response and use the JSON method on it, and we await that promise to fulfill, and then we have the user data, and then we take that JSON user data and run the map higher order function and create a new array that just has the user emails. We just peeled that out of all that other user data, and we call the function, and it logs it to the console, and it logs it to the console within the function. Let's go ahead and comment that out. Now what we've done in the past with traditional functions, we can't do here. We would go console log and attempt to get that information say returned if we had return user email array. And this function would return that data and we would attempt to log it right here. Let's see what happens. It's a promise pending. This console log statement is not within the function and therefore it is not awaiting these promises to fulfill. So it is still pending and that won't work. We can call the function after we've defined it and within the function, these things will happen in the order we expect them to. It's an async function and we're using the await keyword to await the data we need before we filter it or map it create this new array, we've waited to receive that data. And so inside the function, logging to the console will work. We can return this data. However, it would be more likely passed to another function. Console log is a function. We're actually logging that right there. So let's say we had another function. And in this function, it would be uh, well, let's say it's doing something to the DOM. So we'll say post to, to web page. Then we could pass in that user email array. Wow, I can't type. User email array. And post to web page could do something with that. Well, let's define our post to web page function. And it's going to receive data as the parameter. And it is called within our async function, but it is called after we have awaited this data already. So we're not awaiting anything in this function. It doesn't need to be async because we have already waited for this data to arrive. We're calling the function after we've received the data. We've already even worked with the data with our higher order map function here. And so we can just do whatever within this function and it's not really an async await function, it's just put into place within the get all user emails function after we have waited to receive this data. So this one does not need to be async or await. And after we define the post to web page function, we need to go ahead and call get all user emails into action again because when we call this function, it will call the post to web page function at the bottom of its uh, order. User email array is not defined. Oh.
There we go. I need to refer to that as data. There we go. And within the post a web page, it is now logging the data to the console. Okay, let's look at another example. And this example is going to expand on fetch because fetch can receive a second parameter. So second parameter of fetch. And that is usually, or is always, I should say, is a object. And it has some settings that can be defined inside there. So let's define this function and we'll call it get dad joke. We'll start working with a different API. It's an async function. It's going to get a response from fetch. And this will be from the URL iconhasdadjoke.com. But let's look at the second parameter of fetch. It looks like I need to get rid of a couple of extra quotation marks. So we'll put a comma, and then we start to define our object. And in this object, we can define some properties. One is the method. Now, it will default to the get method. But also, uh, you know, there are other methods. A form typically uses post, for example. And we can post data with fetch as well. But in this example, I'll just show the method property and we'll leave it set to get. Then there is a headers property. <clears throat> this is a nested object. And in this example, we'll set accept. And this is the type of data we plan to receive in return. And that is application slash JSON data. And then after that, I think we're finished with the header um, and we're finished with the second parameter of fetch, which I've highlighted there as you see. MDN shows many other parameters and I will have a link to that in the description below this video. Okay, so we've defined our fetch and we expect to await that response. Once again, we get the response and instead of JSON user data, this is going to be JSON joke data and we will await the response.json as we have before. And now, instead of calling other functions or anything we were doing there, we'll go ahead and eliminate that stuff and we'll add a console.log for the JSON joke data, so we can see what that is. Let me save this and we'll call this function get dad joke. We'll call that into action. And there you can see in the console we got a dad joke. It has a really weird ID value. And here's the joke. And then we see the status. And status is 200, which also would be response.ok. We could say if response dot OK uh, do something, but in this regard, we're just bypassing that and getting the response, turning it into JSON data, and then we log that. So if we just want to log the joke instead of the full JSON data, I guess I can leave that, we just refer to the property. So I would say JSON data dot joke. And now we won't get the status, we don't get the ID, we just get the joke. And of course this is returning a random joke, so every time I save it, it's going to be a different dad joke. You can see it takes just a few milliseconds or a second to get that joke returned from the server. And there you see the best time on a clock is 6.30, hands down. Ha! <laughs> dad joke. Okay, this API also can deliver data that is not JSON. So let's think about that for a second. And instead of JSON joke data, we will switch this to uh, text plain. So we expect to get text plain. Notice I'm not changing anything else. I'm not, it's actually the root URL, which is a little different. It's not a different endpoint. By defining what type of data we accept from this API, it's changing what they deliver. So if we say text plain, and then instead of JSON joke data, I'm going to turn this to text joke data. And instead of awaiting uh, response.json, there is actually a text method as well. So we'll await the response.text. And now I'm just going to log the full text here. And there we go, and we get our joke. 
What has ears but cannot hear? A field of corn. Ha! Another dad joke for sure. But that's an example of not really changing anything except the type of data we expect to receive. And then the API responds differently. Okay, let's switch this back to JSON or application slash JSON, which is typically what we do want to receive from an API. We like to work with JSON most of the time. And we put our JSON joke data and we're awaiting response.json. And let's go ahead and log the full object one more time and get a joke. All right, now I want to go ahead and copy this full object here. And for our next example, we're going to look at using post. And that will also use the second parameter area of fetch as we did here with this joke API, but this will actually post something instead of requesting data. We're requesting to send new data to the API that can be recorded. The API will send us a confirmation back. So let's just call this function post data, and we're going to send in a joke object. And so I need to define this joke object And I'm going to go ahead and remove the status because it doesn't make much sense to send the status. And that looks good. Uh, it will probably, it would look better if I put it on separate lines. So we'd have that, that, and then there we go. There's our joke object. It has an ID already and a joke. And we'll have post data and it accepts a joke object parameter, which remember, this doesn't the parameter doesn't have to have the same name as whatever we've defined. Just when we call the function into action, we'll actually pass in this name. This is a placeholder when we define a function. So post data accepts a joke object. The response will be defined, and we're going to send this to a different address. I'll get that address quickly. This is going to go to a test API that does let us test posting things, and it's httpbin.org, and the endpoint we want is slash post. Now the method that we're going to use instead of get is post, and then instead of accept, we're going to tell the API what content type we are sending. So this would be content-type, and we are going to send JSON, so that's fine. And now we need to specify what we're sending in the body parameter of this. When we post, it has a body parameter. It's not sent as Git does in the URL as a parameter. It's actually in a separate body parameter. And we want to send JSON, so we need to use JSON stringify. And here we'll take that joke object that is the uh, parameter we're defining in the function, and we'll pass that in. That looks good. Now we'll get a response, and we expect to get a JSON response, so that's what I will call this, because we'll have a response that we get, and we'll use the JSON method on it. And at that point, we can log the JSON response that we get, and then we'll call this post data and we'll pass in our joke object. Let's see what response we get. Here's the response we got from the http bin.org slash post endpoint when we posted our data. So we did successfully post that information to this endpoint. Now with every API, just as we did with the dad jokes API and now this test API, you want to go read the documentation for the API and see what they expect and see how they expect the data to be formatted and what headers they accept. As you can see, that was important with that dad jokes API. Now, besides using the second parameter area of fetch, and passing in this object like we have in the past two examples,
You can also pass data in through the URL. And that is, of course, with Git, because that is where Git, the Git method, uh, sends data and not in a separate body uh, property. However, uh, you once again, I need to, uh, I guess, reemphasize, you need to go to those websites and check out the documentation because they'll have different endpoints and they're telling you how to specify uh, the data in the URL so you get the results that are expected. Let's look at a example of that. And here we're going to request a joke. So I will change this once again. We don't need a joke object anymore. And I'll set this function to request joke. And in this example, we'll have two parameters. We'll put in a first name and a last name. So we've got a request joke function that accepts a first name and a last name parameter. And now we've got a response. Uh, we don't need any of this now. We're back to our basic fetch with just the URL. And in this URL, I'm going to use a template literal. I'm just going to copy and paste to save a little bit of time, but I will show you exactly what I'm talking about. In this template literal, I'm specifying the URL and then you can see it starts to add parameters. And you can always identify that in a URL where the question mark starts. And now here's the first parameter. It's first name, and that equals, and I'm taking that first name that we're passing into the function. And that's why I'm using a template literal with the back tick so I can insert that parameter right into the URL. And then you see the ampersand, and that's what chains parameters together after the first one. The question mark identifies where the first parameter in the URL starts. And then the ampersand lets you chain another parameter. And there could be another ampersand and another parameter and so on. And so here's the last name and we're also passing in the last name. So in this example, I'm actually using the uh, internet Chuck Norris database and it's full of Chuck Norris jokes, but we're passing in a first name and a last name that we want to insert into the joke instead of the name Chuck Norris. So there's a response, uh, and then we'll take that and we'll get the JSON response as we have in other examples with the JSON method here, and we await both of those, again, an async function, and then let's just log uh, the JSON response dot value, and that is also important because at first, I would just have to have logged JSON response and then taken a look at the object over here in the console to see what the properties were, to know what I needed to log. Or it could be in the documentation of the API and you could find out that way. I know I want to get the value from that response. So instead of looking at the entire object, we're just going to look at the value property. And here I'm going to uh, call request joke, and instead of Chuck Norris, let's put in Clint Eastwood. And that's mostly because I can't spell Arnold Schwarzenegger. I think I could spell Arnold, but Schwarzenegger would probably be way off. So let's try Clint Eastwood in here. Save that, and here is the joke we get. And we've got the ID, the joke, and the categories. So if we specifically wanted to just get the joke, we would need JSON response dot value dot joke. There you go. The truth will set you free unless Clint Eastwood has you, in which case, forget it, buddy. Yeah. Let's change that. Here's a name I can spell, Bruce Lee, kind of a Chuck Norris action hero as well. Scientifically speaking, it is impossible to charge Bruce Lee with obstruction of justice. This is because even Bruce Lee cannot be in two places at the same time. Ah, yeah, some jokes are probably better than others. Now, let's see what else we might do with this API because there are other parameters we can pass. So besides the first name and the last name, we can add on to the URL another ampersand and then limit to equals, and then this expects an array of categories, and we're just going to give it the nerdy category. We just want nerdy jokes. The class object inherits from Bruce Lee. Ha, that's better. Okay, 
Maybe let's try one more. But these are just nerdy jokes. Bruce Lee can overwrite a locked variable. Maybe not as good as the first one, but I get where they're coming from. Okay, now let's abstract all of this that we can into functions more like we would in an actual program. So let's just say abstract into functions and we'll start breaking some of this down. And the way we would start out is maybe we're pulling data from a form. Um, I'll put maybe from a form on the website, something like that. So we would have a function const, I'll say get data from form. And we'll make this an arrow function. It doesn't need any parameters. But say it gets called into action uh, based on the click of event click event of a button or possibly the submit event of a form, something like that. And we'll define a request object here. So const request object equals, and here we'll have first name, Bruce, last name, Lee, uh, capital L, there we go. And then categories, and now we'll have our array that has our nerdy category in it. And that is our request object. And we're going to return the request object. So that would be our function that gets the data from the form based on the submit event or something like that is when it's called into action. That's the first function. The next one, let's say const build request URL. And there we're going to pass in the request data that is needed to build that URL. And in the build URL, we're just going to return a template literal. And let's look at this template literal that we have here and think about what we could do to modify that so it works in the function. There we go. So we don't want to just return it as is, we want to change that just a little bit. So this would be request data dot first name. Notice how we didn't have to pass in a larger number of parameters. We're just passing in the object. And by doing that, we can then request each of these individual pieces of data from the object. And that keeps our parameter count down as far as making our, our function instead of having this long list of parameters. So once again, here we can say request data, name the parameter and get that. And then even where we have the limit to inside here, we can change this array. And inside the array, we or inside this area, we can say request data dot categories, and it will insert the array that we already have in our object. And we're returning that, and that is the build request URL function. It's just going to return the URL based on the object we pass in. So that is another simple function as we would make in a program. And then we'll have our request joke function. And this will be just a little different now. It won't take the first name and last name. It's just going to accept a URL. And then notice this is an async function once again. Our others aren't. But at this point, this is an async function. And this makes this a lot easier because instead of await fetch with this long URL here, we're just saying await fetch URL. That's nice and short, easy to read. Then our JSON response is the same line as we've had previously. And then from here, we can get a joke array and we can have that set equal to JSON response dot value. Well, when we think about getting an array, uh, we expect to get more than one joke. So let's go back and look at this build request URL. We could just get one here. So maybe we just want to say joke to begin with. So I'll just say joke. And then that is the response dot value. Or this would be a joke object because it's not just down to the joke yet. If it was down to the joke, we would say json response dot value dot value 
joke. So let's let's go ahead and do that. And then we can just log the joke right here. And that would be good enough there. Is there anything else we want to do? Oh yeah, post joke to the page. So instead of logging it right there actually, what we want to do is call a function that would display the joke. So I'll call that post joke to page and we're going to pass in the joke. And now in our post joke to page function, We'll accept a joke and here is where we will go ahead and just log to the console because we don't have a, a DOM set up to work with right now. And now we won't call that request joke we have to call all of these functions into action. See we've got our get data from form that might be called with an event listener and then we've got the build request URL, the request joke, and the post joke to page, but they're not pulled together in any fashion yet. So we need kind of a procedural workflow function. And I'll just put that here again. Procedural workflow function. That's how I look at them. That does all of these things. Now notice we do have an async function that needs to be in this procedural workflow. So when we define this function, we'll call it process joke request. This is actually the function that would be called by an event listener instead of the get data from form. Say there was a click on the submit button or the submit value or this I guess just the submit event is triggered by uh, pressing enter sometimes from a form. It would call this function into action process joke request and it needs to be an async function because it's going to call an async function into action. So here we'll have const request data. And we'll set that equal to our get data from form function. And then we'll const request URL and we'll set that equal to build request URL and of course that function needs the request data that we just defined and then we will await request joke and we'll pass in the request URL and then we could just pretty much be done at that point or we could log finished just so we know we're done here in this example. But this is the function, our process joke request, that would be called into action by an event in the DOM and then all of these other things would fall into place based on that. But we've broken out all of these things into functions so they could work uh, one at a time and that happens in this procedural workflow function. So. Let's pretend that something calls all of these into action now, like a, a submit event. And I'll just put process joke request and we'll call it here. Save that. And here we get our joke. Bruce Lee can write to an output stream and then we get finished. Um, and it looks a lot longer, but this is how we would actually approach this in a program, we would write individual functions for each of these things. And abstracting this, of course, lets us build a different request URL if we need to by getting different data. And of course, we wouldn't always assign Bruce Lee as the name. Possibly there's something else built into our program that would let us assign different names or pick different categories. And then we end up requesting the joke and here is where we might work with the DOM to actually post the joke to the page and instead we're just logging it to the console. And this procedural workflow function pulls it all together. And you can see that I just called the function right here instead of actually setting it up with some button in the DOM to do so. But you need to remember this function needs to be async because we're using await when we call the request joke function 
and that request joke function is async, which is why we can use await with it. And it's saying, let all of this finish before we do anything else. Hi, I'm Dave, and I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Remember to keep striving for daily progress instead of perfection. Subscribe to my channel and ring the bell to be alerted when I post new tutorials. I'll see you next time.